Li Jing, the first god of war of the Great Tang Dynasty, is the deified character of Tota Heavenly King in the God Seal list. Li Jing was a general and a prime minister in both civil and military affairs, and was directly recognized as a god in later times. He fought for the Great Tang, and his achievements were not inferior to those of Li Shimi. He used the army like a god, brave and resourceful, and was invincible in battle. A battle to determine the northern border, 60 years old age to conquer the Qinghai Plateau. The Qinghai Sea forever into the map of the Great Tang. Establishing a Great Tang map from the Korean Peninsula in the east to the Sea of Japan in the west to Central Asia, which is also the largest map of the Huaxia Dynasty in the past thousand years. Li Jing. Military management and combat experience further enriched the ideas and theories of the Chinese army. He authored a number of military books, including Li Jing's Six Military Mirrors. Gradually deified during the late Tang Dynasty, Li Jing transformed himself into the Heavenly King of Tota, the result is that many people don't recognize Li Jing, the military wizard of the Tang Dynasty, but only the God-fearing Tota Li Tianhua. Today, let's take a look at Li Jing's legendary life in chronological order. If you like this video, please remember to like the subscription rating, your support is my greatest creative power. Early Life Born into a family of officials during the Northern Zhou Dynasty, Li Jing was the nephew of the Sui general, Han Qinghu. His grandfather Li Chongyi was a governor, and his father Li Quan served in the Sui Dynasty. Handsome and tall, Li Jing was influenced by his family's scholarly and martial traditions from a young age. He once told his father, a man, if born in a time of a wise ruler, should seek to achieve great deeds and wealth, rather than just being a scholar. His uncle, Han Qinghu, a renowned Sui general, always marveled at Li Qing discussions on military matters. As an adult, Li Qing held several minor positions in the Sui dynasty. Although these positions were modest, he used his intelligence to make a name for himself in the imperial court. From 605 to 617 AD, at the age of 35, Li Qing began fighting against the Turkic alongside Li Yue. However, by this time, rebellions against the Sui dynasty's tyranny were rampant, and the insurgents were resisting the Sui rule with overwhelming force. Serving as the governor of Taiyuan for the Sui dynasty, Li Yuan was secretly recruiting soldiers and preparing for action. Li Jing, realizing Li Yuan's intentions, disguised himself as a prisoner to go to Jiangdu, intending to inform Emperor Sui Yang about Li Yuan's plans. However, when Li Qing arrived at the capital Chang'an, the Guangzhou region was already in chaos, and he couldn't proceed due to blocked roads. Shortly after, Li Yuan raised an army in Taiyuan and swiftly conquered Chang'an, capturing the 47-year-old Li Qi. Li Jing, a man of great knowledge and unfulfilled ambitions, passionately exclaimed before his execution, you raised a righteous army to eliminate tyranny for the people. Why end a great cause with personal vendettas by executing a man of valor? Impressed by his eloquence and demeanor, Li Yuan and Li Shimin admired his intelligence and bravery, leading to his release and subsequent recruitment into their council. Pacify Xiaoxi After Li Yuan established the Tang Dynasty and ascended the throne, Li Shimin was appointed as the Prince of Qin. In a bid to quell other separatist forces, the 50-year-old Li Qing, aligning with Li Shimin, marched eastward. Their campaign culminated in the elimination of Wang Shichong, who had proclaimed himself emperor in Luoyang, marking the beginning of Li Qing's rise to prominence. Shortly after the battle began, the regime of Xiaoxi, entrenched in Jiangling, dispatched a naval force upriver in an attempt to seize territory from the Tang dynasty. Li Yuan, seeking to eliminate the separatist force of Xiaoxi, dispatched Li Qing to Quezhou to quell the uprising. Following orders, Li Qing, with a few cavalrymen, set off on his mission. En route, while passing through Jinzhou, he encountered the tribal leader Deng Shiluo, who had amassed tens of thousands of troops in the mountain valleys. The prince of Lujiang, Li Yuan, had previously attempted to subdue these forces but suffered repeated defeats. Li Jing, advising Li Yuan, devised a strategy that led to a decisive victory over the tribal forces, capturing many prisoners. This success allowed Li Jing to smoothly pass through Jinzhou and reach Xiazhou, at that time, due to Xiaoxi controlling strategic passes, Li Qing's progress was hindered and delayed. Li Yuan mistakenly thought he was intentionally delaying and secretly ordered Xu Shao to execute him. However, appreciating Li Qing's talents, Xu Shao pleaded for his life, and Li Qing was spared. Soon after, the tribal leader An Zhao of Kaizhou rebelled against the Tang, attacking Kuizhou. The prince of Zhao Jun, Li Xiaogong, led the Tang forces but was defeated. Li Qing then led 800 soldiers to raid their camp decisively defeating the tribal forces. Later, he set an ambush in a strategic location, 
killing Yan Zhao and capturing over 5,000 people. When the news of the victory reached the capital, Li Yuan joyfully said to his ministers, I've heard that using a person who has made mistakes is better than using one who has only achieved successes. Li Jing has indeed accomplished a great feat, he immediately issued an imperial decree, commending, Li Jing, your utmost dedication and remarkable achievements have revealed your boundless loyalty over time. You shall receive ample rewards and need not worry about honor and wealth. Li Jing, sincere loyalty earned Li Yuan trust, changing his previous misgivings, and he personally wrote to Li Jing, saying, let bygones be bygones, I have long forgotten the past. In January 621 AD Li Jing, Assessing the situation of both sides, presented ten strategies to conquer Xiaoxi. Li Yuan took these seriously and in February, appointed Li Xiaogong as the commander of Guizhou and promoted Li Jing to chief marshal, also serving as the chief of staff under Li Xiaogu. Believing Li Xiaogong was not very proficient in military affairs, Li Yuan entrusted Li Jing with the command of all three armies. Li Jing organized manpower and resources to build ships and train soldiers in naval warfare, preparing to descend upon Jiangli. Meanwhile, he noticed that the tribes of Ba and Shu, recently annexed by Tang, were still unstable. To alleviate concerns about their loyalty, Li Jing persuaded Li Xiaogong to summon the chieftain's sons to Guizhou, appointing them to various official positions based on their abilities, a move that positively impacted the political stability in Ba and Shu. In September of the same year, Li Yuan ordered the mobilization of troops from Ba and Shu to assemble in Guizhou, he appointed Li Xiaogong as the commander of the Jingxiang military expedition, with Li Jing as the chief of staff, overseeing 12 commanders, marching eastward from Guizhou. Additionally, Li Yuan was appointed as the marshal of the Jingying route, leading the northern army from Xiangzhou, while Tian Shikang, the governor of Tianzhou, led the southern army from Chenzhou, and Zhou Faming, the commander of Huangzhou, led the eastern army from Xiakou. These four armies advanced simultaneously in a massive military offensive towards Jiangli. During the autumn rainy season, the river swelled, and the roaring waters of the three gorges thundered through the canyons. Xiaoxi assumed the turbulent waters and treacherous three gorges would prevent the Tang army from advancing eastward, so he rested his troops without taking precautions. Many Tang generals were intimidated by the flood and suggested waiting for the waters to recede before advancing. However, Li Jing, with his extraordinary courage and strategy, firmly disagreed, arguing, speed is of the essence in warfare, and opportunity must not be missed. Our forces have just assembled, and Xiaoxi is unaware. If we take advantage of the high waters to move swiftly downstream, appearing suddenly at Jiangling, it would be an unanticipated strike, the best strategy in warfare. Even if Xiaoxi learns of our advance, his hasty assembly of troops will be inadequate for battle, ensuring our swift victory and capture of Xiaoxi. Convinced by Li Jing's argument, Li Xiaogong led over 2,000 warships down the Three Gorges. Due to Xiaoxi's unpreparedness, the Tang army successively captured Jingmen and Yidu, advancing victoriously to reach Yiling by October. At this time, Xiaoxi's valiant general Wen Shihong was stationed in Qingjiang with tens of thousands of elite troops. When Li Xiaogong forces arrived, he was eager to attack. However, Li Jing advised caution, noting Wen Shihong's strength and the high morale of his troops, especially after the recent loss of Jingma. Li Jing suggested anchoring their warships on the south bank of the Yangtze River and avoiding direct confrontation until the enemy's morale declined, ensuring a victory in a decisive battle. Although Li Jing's strategy was sound, Li Xiaogong, overconfident from continuous victories, underestimated the enemy and ignored the advice, leaving Li Jing to guard the camp while he led the troops into battle. As Li Jing predicted, Li Xiaogong, forces suffered a significant defeat and retreated to the south bank with heavy losses. Wen Shihong, troops, victorious, plundered the area, acquiring substantial loot. Seizing the opportunity of the enemy's disarray, Li Jing quickly commanded the Tang army to attack. Caught off guard, Wen Shihong, army was decisively defeated by the Tang forces, with nearly 10,000 killed or drowned, and over 400 ships captured. After capturing Yiling, Li Jing, promptly led 5,000 cavalry as the vanguard towards Jiangling, the capital of Nanliang, with Li Xiaogong and the main army following. The defeat of Wen Shihong terrified Xiaoxi. Newly conscripted troops in the south had not yet arrived. As Li Xiaogong army continued the assault, Li Jing defeated Xiaoxi formidable generals Yang Junmao and Zheng Wenxiu, capturing over 4,000 soldiers, seizing Jiangling outer city, and then the water city, along with a large number of ships. However, Li Jing ordered these ships to be abandoned in the river to drift downstream. This decision puzzled the generals, who thought the captured enemy ships could be used for their navy. Li Jing 
explained that if they were besieged without capturing the city and faced reinforcements from all sides, the situation would be dire, even with ships. By abandoning the ships, they would block the river downstream, making reinforcements think Jiangling had fallen and hesitate to advance. This strategy would buy them a month, enough time to capture the city. Li Jing. Deceptive tactic worked effectively. Xiao Xi. Reinforcements downstream saw the abandoned ships scattered in the river, assumed Jiangling had fallen, and hesitated to advance. Qiu He, the governor of Jiaozhou, and Gao Shilian, the chief scribe, were on their way to Jiangling but, hearing of Xiao Xi's defeat, surrendered to Li Xiaogong camp. The Tang army besieged Jiangling so tightly that nothing could get through. Xiao Xi, seeing no way out with no external reinforcements and unable to sustain inside, had no choice but to open the gates and surrender to the Tang forces. Li Jing, led the army into the city, maintaining strict discipline, ensuring no harm came to the civilians. At this time, the generals believed Xiao Xi and his commanders had resisted the official army and committed heinous crimes, suggesting confiscation of their property to reward the soldiers. However, Li Jing, immediately intervened and persuaded them otherwise, stating, the army of a sovereign should comfort and protect the people, fighting only against evil. The common people have already suffered from the war, and resisting was not their wish. Moreover, it's natural for a dog to bark at strangers, those who died fighting for Xiao Xi did so out of loyalty, and should not be treated the same as rebels. This is why Kui Tong was spared by Emperor Gaozu. Now, having just pacified Jingzhou and Jiangling, we should adopt a policy of leniency to win the hearts of the people. Confiscating the property of those who have surrendered to us does not align with the principles of saving lives. If we do this, other towns and enemy commanders might resist to the death, refusing to surrender. This is not a wise decision. Li Jing. Foresight, magnanimity, and lack of greed for treasures set him apart from the other generals. This approach won the hearts of many, and as a result, regions along the Yangtze and Han rivers surrendered one after another. A few days after Xiao Xi's surrender, hundreds of thousands of reinforcements arrived. Hearing of Xiao Xi's surrender and the Tang dynasty's lenient policies, they too laid down their weapons and surrendered without a fight. With Li Qing assistance, Li Xiaogong took only two months to eliminate Nanliang, the largest separatist force in southern China. For his outstanding military achievements, Li Yuan conferred upon him the title of Pillar of the State and Count of Yongkang, along with a reward of 2,500 pieces of property. Pacify the South of the Yellow River After the successful campaign in Jiangling, Li Qing's exceptional military talent was further recognized by Li Yuan, who entrusted him with significant responsibilities. Right after the end of the conflict, Li Yuan promoted Li Qing to the position of acting governor of Jingzhou, instructing him to pacify the various states in Yingnan and granting him special authority to appoint and confer titles. In November 621 AD, Li Qing crossed the Nanling and arrived in Guizhou. He sent envoys on different routes to persuade the local leaders to submit. Wherever they went, the regions quickly surrendered. Major chieftains like Feng Ang, Li Guangdu, and Ying Changchen sent their sons and other relatives to meet Li Qing and express their allegiance. Li Qing, with his special authority, appointed them to official positions, leading to the swift submission of 96 states and over 600,000 households. Gas, Lingnan was entirely pacified. Li Yuan, issued an edict acknowledging his efforts and appointed him as the grand envoy for pacifying Lingnan and acting governor of Guizhou. Believing that the southern regions, being remote and having not benefited from the imperial grace since the chaos at the end of the Sui dynasty, required a combination of cultural influence and military might to change their customs, Li Qing led his troops from Guizhou on a southern tour. Everywhere he went, Li Qing personally, consoled the elders and inquired about their hardships, winning the support of the local people and ensuring widespread satisfaction and social stability. Pacifa Fu Gongshi in 623 AD, Fu Gongshi, a farmer who had previously surrendered to the Tang dynasty, rebelled against the Tang again. Li Yuan, appointed Li Xiaogong as the commander, with the 53-year-old Li Jing as his deputy, to lead the campaign against the rebellion. Fu Gongshi, General Ping Huiliang, stationed a navy of 30,000 at Dangtu, while Chen Zhengdao, LED 20,000 infantry and cavalry at Qinglin. They stretched iron chains across the Yangtze River at Yangshan to block the waterway and built Tianyuecheng, extending over 10 miles, creating a formidable defense. During a military council, the generals suggested that since Feng Huiliang and Chen Zhengtong were holding strong positions and seemingly intended to defend without engaging in battle, it would be difficult to conquer their fortifications immediately. They proposed to directly target Danyang, the stronghold of Fu Gongshi. 
If Danyang fell, Feng Huiliang and others would likely surrender without a fight. Li Xiaogong considered adopting the general suggestion. Fu Gongshi, subordinate, Feng Huiliang, held a defensive position, inviting battle. Li Xiaogong maintained his defenses and did not engage, instead dispatching surprise troops to cut off the enemy's supply lines. The besieged forces gradually starved. At night, Li Xiaogong provoked the enemy by sending out weaker soldiers to challenge them, while keeping Lu Zhushang elite cavalry ready for battle. The weak soldiers soon retreated, and the overconfident enemy pursued them, only to be met by Lu Zhushang prepared forces, resulting in a crushing defeat for the enemy. Feng Huiliang retreated to Liangshan, and Li Xiaogong seized the opportunity to conquer the separate fortress on Liangshan, resulting in thousands of enemy soldiers drowning. Li Jing Strategic planning and accurate judgment were crucial. On March 28 of the seventh year of the Wuda era, April 21, 624 AD, Fu Gongshi, finding himself in a desperate situation, abandoned Danyang and fled. Li Xiaogong sent cavalry to pursue him, eventually capturing Fu Gongshi in Wu Ka. Thus, the Tang army quelled Fu Gongshi rebellion. In recognition of Li Jing military achievements, Li Yuan bestowed upon him a thousand pieces of property, a hundred slaves, and a hundred fine horses. He established the Southeastern Administrative Office and appointed Li Jing as the Minister of Military Affairs for the office. Li Yuan admired his military talent greatly, exclaiming, Li Jing is the bane of Xiao Xi and Fu Gongshi. Not even ancient, great generals like Han Xin, Bai Qi, Wei Qing, or Huo Qubing can compare to him. After stabilizing the situation in the south, tensions rose again in the north. During the transition from the Sui to the Tang dynasty, the Eastern Eastern Turks were a formidable force. When Yi Yuan first raised his army in Taiyuan, he had submitted to the Eastern Turks Kagan Shibi Khan in exchange for relative peace in the north. After the establishment of the Tang dynasty, the Eastern Turks supported separatist forces like Xue Chu and Liu Wuzhou against the Tang, and also frequently invaded from the north due to their military strength. Li Jing, who had been instrumental in pacifying the south, was then reassigned to the north to counter the Eastern Turks threat. In August 625 AD, the Eastern Turks Kagan Jeli Khan led an army of over a hundred thousand across the Shiling to invade Taiyue. Li Yuan immediately appointed Li Jing as the chief commander, leading over 10,000 Jianghuai soldiers stationed in Taiku to join forces with the governor of Bingzhou, Ren Gui, to confront the enemy. Facing the fierce onslaught of the Eastern Turks, many armies suffered defeats, and Ren Gui force was annihilated, but Li Jing army remained intact. Soon after, Li Jing was appointed as the chief commander of the Lingzhou route to counter the Eastern Eastern Turks. In August 626 AD, just after Li Shimin ascended the throne, Jieli Khan of the Eastern Eastern Turks seized the opportunity of the Tang imperial transition to launch an attack. Leading tens of thousands of elite cavalry, they invaded Jingzhou, advancing rapidly to the north of Weishui. Jieli Khan frequently sent out his best riders to challenge the Tang forces and even sent his confidant loss of thinking to the Tang court to assess the situation. At that time, the military forces from various states had not yet arrived, and the armed civilians in Chang'an numbered only a few tens of thousands, creating a highly precarious situation. Li Shimin personally risked a meeting with Jieli Khan at Weishui Bridge, leading to an alliance and the subsequent withdrawal of the Eastern Turks. Afterwards, Li Shimin promoted Li Jing to Minister of Justice and concurrently commander of the Crown Prince's left guard, granting him an estate of 400 households. Not long after, Li Jing was transferred to the Ministry of War. Destruction of the Eastern Eastern Turks Soon after, internal turmoil struck the Eastern Eastern Turks. Severe blizzards resulted in the death of many sheep and horses, causing famine and scattering the tribes. Li Shimin decided to seize this opportunity to strike at the Eastern Eastern Turks and eliminate this threat once and for all. The 59-year-old Li Jing, as the main commander of this campaign, led hundreds of thousands of troops on multiple fronts against the Eastern Turks. In January 630, under harsh winter conditions, Li Jing led 3,000 elite cavalry from Ma'i towards Liangli. The sudden advance of the Tang army took Jieli Khan by surprise, causing panic among his generals. They reasoned that Li Jing would not have ventured deep into enemy territory without a substantial force, leading to frequent shocks throughout the day. Upon learning this, Li Jing secretly ordered spies to sow discord among the Eastern Turks leaders, leading to the defection of Jieli Khan confidant Kang Su Mi. Li Jing then launched an attack on Ding Xiang, capturing the city under the cover of night, including Yang Zhengdao, the son of the former Sui Prince Yang Lan, and the former Sui Empress Xiao. Jieli Khan fled in disarray towards Tikal. 
For his military achievements, Li Jing was promoted to Duke of Daiguo, awarded an additional estate of 3,000 households, 600 pieces of property, famous horses, and treasures. Li Shimin, delighted, told his ministers, Han Dynasty's Li Ling led 5,000 infantry against the Xiongnu and ended up surrendering to them, yet he is still remembered in history. Li Jing, led 3,000 cavalry deep into enemy territory, conquered Dingxiang, and intimidated the northern tribes. This unprecedented feat eclipses the past shame of allying with the Eastern Turks at Weishui. Simultaneously, as Li Jing advanced victoriously, Li Ti also led his army from Yunzhong and encountered the Eastern Turks' army at Baida. The Tang forces fought valiantly, routing the Eastern Turks. Defeated and suffering heavy losses, Jieli Khan retreated to Tieshan, regrouping his remaining forces of a few tens of thousands of soldiers and horses. Jieli Khan, finding himself in a desperate situation, sent loss of thinking to the Tang court to plead guilty and express a desire to submit to the Tang dynasty, even offering to visit the court in person. However, internally, he was still hesitant and hoped to buy time to recuperate and eventually flee north across the desert for a resurgence. In February of the same year, Li Shimin sent the court official Tang Tian and the general An Xiuren to reassure Jieli Khan. Sensing the true intent behind Li Shimin's actions, Li Ting said to Zhang Gongjin, When the envoys reach Jieli Khan, the Eastern Turks will surely lower their guard. We should seize this opportunity to select 10,000 elite cavalry and carry 20 days of rations to attack the Eastern Turks from Baidao. Zhang Gongjin expressed concern about attacking while the envoys were there, but Li Ting insisted it was a prime opportunity for a surprise attack comparing it to the strategy of Han Xin in defeating the state of Qi. Li Jing, army advanced to Yinshan, encountering over a thousand Eastern Turk scouts, whom they captured and made to march with the Tang army. When Jieli Khan met the Tang envoys, he let down his guard. The Tang vanguard, led by Su Dingfang, took advantage of a heavy fog to advance stealthily, getting within seven miles of Jieli Khan camp before being detected. Startled like a frightened bird, Jieli Khan hurriedly fled on horseback, and his army scattered. Li Jing. Forces arrived soon after, killing over 10,000 enemies, capturing hundreds of thousands, seizing countless cattle and sheep, and killing the Sui Princess Cheng. Jieli Khan, with over 10,000 men, tried to flee north across the desert but was blocked by Li Jiatsiko and could not escape. His chieftains eventually surrendered. Soon after, Jieli Khan was captured by the commander of Datong Dao and the prince of Yuncheng, Li Daozong, and brought to the capital. Thus, the eastern eastern Turks were annihilated. Since the Sui dynasty, the eastern Turks had been a formidable power in the northwest. The annihilation of the eastern eastern Turks by Li Jing and others not only eliminated the threat to the Tang's northwestern border but also erased the humiliation of Yi Yuan and Li Shimin having to submit to the eastern Turks. Reflecting on this, Li Shimin said, I heard that a minister should feel shame when his lord is anxious and be willing to die if his lord is humiliated. When the Tang dynasty was founded, the Emperor Emeritus submitted to the Eastern Turks for the sake of the people, which has always caused me great pain and determination to eradicate the Eastern Turks, leaving me restless and without appetite. Now, with just a partial mobilization of our forces, we have been invincible, bringing the Chanyu to submission, finally erasing the shame of submission from years past. The Emperor Emeritus Li Yuan was also overjoyed and summoned Li Shimin, several nobles, princes, princesses, and others to the Ling Yan to celebrate. In a spontaneous moment, Li Yuan even played the pipa himself, Li Shimin danced, and the ministers raised toasts one after another, continuing the celebration into the night. Despite Li Qing valor and strategic prowess on the battlefield, he was known for his composed and profound character. After the campaign against the Eastern Eastern Turks, censor Dr. Xiaoyu accused Li Jing of poor military discipline, alleging that treasures and artifacts were looted by soldiers during the raid on Jieli Khan camp. Li Shimin reprimanded Li Jing harshly, and Li Jing admitted his fault. Later, Li Shimin said to Li Jing, In the past, the Sui general Shi Wan Sui defeated the Kagan Data Khan but received no reward, leading to the dynasty's downfall. I will not repeat this mistake. Your mismanagement will be pardoned, and your achievements against the Eastern Turks will be recorded. Thus, Li Jing was appointed as Dr. Zhu Guanglu, granted a thousand rolls of silk and an additional estate totaling 500 households. Li Shimin also reassured Li Jing about the past slander, gifting him 2,000 rolls of silk and promoting him to Shangshu Yopu She. In the court, Li Jing was known for his calm and respectful demeanor, often appearing reticent. Expedition against the Tuyuhan. As a young man, Li Jing was ambitious, but once he attained wealth and status, he feared becoming complacent and knew when to step back. 
In October 634 AD, after serving four years as a chancellor, Li Qing resigned due to a foot ailment, insisting earnestly on his departure. Li Shimin appreciated his decision, and Chen Wenben, a court official, conveyed Li Shimin's message that Li Qing's contentment and willingness to step down were commendable and rare virtues. He was awarded the title of Te Jin, given a thousand pieces of property, and two state horses. He was also invited to attend the government affairs at the Zhongshu and Menxia departments every two or three days, health permitting. However, just two months later, the Tu Yuhan invaded Liangzhou, prompting the Tang court to plan a military response. Li Shimin immediately thought of the wise and respected Li Qing as the commander, despite his foot ailment. The veteran general, energized by the news of the expedition against the Tu Yuhan, disregarded his ailment and age, and volunteered to lead the campaign. Li Shimin was overjoyed and appointed Li Qing as the commander-in-chief of the Western Sea Route in December of the same year. He also appointed five others, including Minister of War Hou Junqi and Minister of Punishment Li Daozong, as commanders under Li Qing leadership. Thus, a large-scale counteroffensive against the Tuyuhan commenced. During his mission, Li Qing faced harsh winter conditions, enduring the rigors of travel on icy roads and sleeping outdoors. In the leap April of the following year, the Tang army engaged the Tuyuhan at Kushan, with the Daozong division scoring a significant victory, marking a successful start to the campaign. The cunning Tuyuhan leader Fu Yum Khan retreated westward while ordering his men to burn the grasslands, cutting off the Tang army's horse feed. With the dry grass burned and new grass not yet grown, many generals believed the weakened horses couldn't sustain a long pursuit. However, Ou Junti argued that the Tuyuhan forces were scattered and vulnerable, urging an immediate attack to avoid future regret. Li Qing agreed, deciding not to give the enemy any respite. He split the army into two groups, one led by himself, Xu Wanjun, and Li Daliang from the north, and the other by Hou Junti and Li Daozong from the south. The northern force, led by Li Qing, progressed smoothly. Xu Guo, one of his commanders, defeated the Tuyuhan army at Mantoshan, capturing their leader and using the captured livestock as provisions. Li Qing, main force then scored two more victories at Niu Xindui and Chi Shuiyue. The southern force, led by Hou Junti and Li Daozong, penetrated deep into the desert, facing extreme temperatures, water scarcity, and other hardships. Despite these challenges, they caught up with Fu Yun Khan at Wuhai in May, inflicting another major defeat and capturing Tu Yuhan leaders. Xu Wanjun force also defeated the Tu Yuhan's Tian Zhu Wang army at Chihai. Continuing their advance, Li Qing forces achieved more victories. Li Daliang troops defeated the Tu Yuhan at Shu Hunshan, capturing 20 of their leaders. Another commander, loss of thinking, also won at Ju Ru Chua. The Tang army pushed forward, reaching the western border of Tu Yuhan at Tiemo. In a decisive attack, Chibi Heli pursued Fu Yun Khan, destroying his camp, killing thousands, and capturing his family. Fu Yun Khan, with just over a thousand cavalry, fled to Tijong, a desperate situation leading to desertions. Soon after, he was killed by his own men. His son, Da Ning Wang, Mu Rongshun, killed Tian Zhu Wang, and surrendered to the Tang. After two months of fierce fighting, Li Qing successfully annihilated the Tuyuhan and reported the victory to the Tang capital. To control the former Tuyuhan territories, the Tang dynasty appointed Mu Rongshun as the king of Xipingjun and Lvu Sweet Bean as Khan, leaving Li Daliang to assist in defense. Keep the door closed. After his campaign against the Tuyuhan, Li Qing faced a difficult situation. The commander of the Salt Lake route, Gao Zengsheng, failed to arrive on time during the campaign, leading to a delay in military operations. Li Qing reprimanded him, but Gao Zengsheng, harboring resentment, conspired with the chief secretary of the Guangzhou governor's office, Tang Fengyi, to falsely accuse Li Qing of plotting a rebellion. Emperor Li Shimin ordered an investigation, which revealed the truth and led to Gao Zengsheng being demoted and exiled for false accusation. Following this incident, Li Qing became reclusive, closing his doors to visitors, even to his relatives. In 637 AD, Li Shimin retitled Li Qing as the Duke of Weiguo and appointed him as the governor of Puzhou, maintaining his hereditary title, which later was not implemented due to the death of his descendants. In 640, Li Qing wife passed away. Li Shimin decreed that her tomb be built in the shapes of the Iron Mountain in Eastern Turks territory and the accumulated Stone Mountain in Tuyuhan territory, commemorating Li Qing's extraordinary military achievements. In 644, Li Shimin personally visited Li Qing, who was ill, and bestowed upon him 500 rolls of silk, promoting him to the position of Kaifu Yi Tongsansi. 
Preparing for a campaign against Gao Goli, Li Shimin consulted the septuagenarian Li Jing, asking for his opinion on conquering the region. Despite his illness, Li Jing expressed his willingness to join the campaign but feared he might die en route and inconvenience the emperor. Li Shimin reassured him by comparing him to Sima Yi, who served Chao Wei despite old age and illness. Li Jing requested to join the campaign despite his condition but had to stop at Xiangzhou due to worsening health. Though Li Qing didn't participate in the Gao Goli campaign, he remained keenly interested in the military affairs. When Li Shimin reached Zhu Bishan, facing a significant challenge from Gao Goli, Li Daozong had once suggested a surprise attack on Pyongyang with 5,000 elite troops, which Li Shimin did not approve. After returning to the capital, Li Shimin asked Li Qing why he struggled against a smaller state despite commanding vast armies. Realizing Li Shimin had not heeded Li Daozong's strategy, Li Jing suggested asking Li Daozong for an explanation. Li Shimin learned about the unheeded advice and lamented, time passed too quickly, I didn't even remember it. Be respected in life and lamented in death. In 649 AD, as Li Jing's health deteriorated, Li Shimin, who was also seriously ill at the time, personally visited him. Seeing Li Jing in critical condition, Li Shimin was deeply moved and tearfully said, you have been a lifelong friend and have contributed greatly to the state. It worries me to see you like this. On July 2nd of the same year, Li Qing passed away at the age of 79. Li Shimin posthumously awarded him the titles of Sutu and Dudu of Bingzhou, along with ceremonial honors such as a procession with swords, feathers, drums, and bugles. He was buried with honors at Zhaoling and given the posthumous title Jingwu. Li Qing is also included among the 72 famous generals of the Song dynasty and is one of the 37 historical ministers enshrined and worshipped in the temples of past emperors, extending up to the Qing dynasty. His statue was placed in the imperial ancestral temple as one of the 41 accompanying ministers, sharing royal sacrificial rites with the emperors of various dynasties. According to legend, after his death, Li Jing often appeared as a spirit to help the people in times of danger and distress. As a result, temples were built in his honor. By the late Tang period, Li Jing gradually became deified. Through the efforts of Chinese folk artists over a thousand years, Bhairava and Li Jing were eventually merged into one deity, becoming the supreme commander of the celestial warriors, Tuota Li Tianwa. Consequently, especially due to his portrayal in literary works like Journey to the West and Investiture of the Gods, Li Jing became more widely known as Marshal Canopy than as the distinguished general of the early Tang dynasty. This led to later generations being more familiar with the deified version of Yi Jing as martial canopy than recognizing his military genius from the Tang dynasty.